Ecclesiastes chapter 1, take your Bible there, say amen. Did you bring a Bible? If you didn't, we'll give you one. It's right there in front of you on the pew. On the pew. We still have Bibles in the pews, don't we? We better have. Or I'm going to be awfully upset about it. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. We're, this is called the cycles of Christian growth, the cycles of salvation, uh, the process of salvation, the process of growing in Christ. There's a lot of, lot of things to call it, a lot of things to learn by it, a lot of, um, a lot of things that we're going to gain as we go through this process. I'm taking my time uh, to teach you each and every step from the Word of God to do as good a job as I can, even like with last week. And I'll tell you something, last week, God was all in that. If you were here last week and you know what happened, my notes never showed up. They never did. And uh, I had them at home. I could go to any one of these computers. We all linked to a, a cloud service and find it on there. It never showed up here. And I'm just like, you know what I haven't done? I haven't checked to see if they're on here yet. Hang on a second. Day two, day three, day four. Oh, good, 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 good. <laughs> All right, they're on here now, which is good because that's what I've got for today. <laughs> but God was all in that thing. And I, there's a story to tell that I can't tell. But I'm telling you, God was in that. And uh, I praise him for it. Anyway, let's read Ecclesiastes chapter 1. This is Solomon speaking in wisdom. God showed him scientifically. The, uh, and I like things related to science. I'm not a scientist, but I like things related to science. I like things related to creation. That really, I love that. Anything to do with space, anything to do with stars and moons and planets and so on. I like all that stuff. And so anyway, Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 4, Solomon says, One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh. But the earth abideth forever. The sun also ariseth, and the sun goeth down, and hasteth to his place where he arose. Has there ever been a day when the sun did not go down? Even on the day when the sun stood still, what happened eventually? It went down. And they had breakfast the next morning. Amen. The wind goes, to, verse 6, the wind goes toward the south and turneth about unto the north. It whirleth about continually and the wind returneth again according to his, and there it is. It's, it's giving you the word right there, circuits. Circuits. Your life since you were born, in fact, since before you were born, your life has gone in circuits. Or you can call them circles, or you can call them cycles, but everything about your life, this, this thing that was here last year and is gone, you will come back, there it will be again, only hopefully better than it was last year, come back, or last month, or last week. Or yesterday either way it's going to happen that way and somebody asked me the question is there anything are there are there any Christians is there a is there a, a time that we get in our Christian life that we don't go in these cycles and I would have to say no I think they're always as long as we're alive in this world we are as we are part of this world and if this world goes in cycles, then we go in cycles. Everything about us. So verse um, 7, all the rivers, here it is. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. And here's the, uh, the uh, analogy of it. This is the actual picture that Solomon drew. Some of you didn't catch that. Either that or it wasn't funny. Okay, it wasn't funny. But anyway, this is the tree that Solomon planted. Okay? Uh, but this is your life right here. This is your life. 
times, times when God was blessing, times when uh, it seemed like there was nothing going on in your life. And this little, let me get to this little doodad here. This little doodad right here, I've been paying attention to this. Let me see if I can draw, there it is. Y'all like my drawings? This little thing right there. You know what that looks like? That looks like a burr in your saddle or a thorn in your flesh. How many of you have ever had a thorn in your flesh? Say amen. You've got one now. You've got one now. Okay? And I want you to notice that for several seasons, that thing was there and it didn't go away. Is that because you didn't have enough faith? No. Is that because... Uh, you didn't believe God enough or you didn't pay enough money to the preacher or whatever. No, God is the one who put it there and he put it there for a reason. And it's all concerning his glory and his power. Psalm 1, turn there. Psalm chapter 1, one of my favorite places in the Bible. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit. Here it is. In his season his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. So I'm going to ask you again this morning, would you like so that everything that you do in God's kingdom, would you like it that everything that you do be prosperous for God, for His kingdom, for His glory's sake, for His name's sake? Would you like to be like how Jesus described in John 15, where He said, uh, I am the vine and ye are the branches. And He said, it's, it's my Father's pleasure to bring forth good fruit on you because that, that brings my... I'm paraphrasing here, but he said, that brings my father much joy that he can bring forth fruit on the vines that he has planted. God wants you to be fruitful. God wants you to be uh, righteous. God wants you to be blessed. God wants you to be what he has placed you on this earth to be. Now think about that for a while. And with everybody here, it's different. My calling, my life, the way I see things, the way I do things is different than your life, your calling, your point of view, uh, the things that you do, the things that you don't do. Those things are all different than mine, but they all are part of what God wants to do in your life to bring forth pleasure unto Him to make his garden look beautiful and God wants to bless you and cause you to be blessed with the things that God wants to bless you with. That all sounds funny like I'm repeating myself and I am. But it's, it's that simple. God wants you to be blessed with the things that God wants you to be blessed with. It's, and, hey, yeah, amen. It's not, it's not hard to figure out once you think about it. So... In the, in the days of creation, we see these cycles. Genesis chapter 1, I'm not going to read all of this, but this is the very beginning. So let's, let's take it from the point of view of somebody who's been a Christian now 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Uh, they've sort of matured in Christ, but they've also come to a place where they recognize that uh, not, not all the time are they, do they seem to be living right, not all the time do they, um, uh, do they seem to be acting right. It, it seems like sometimes uh, they're, they're, they're failing. Sometimes they're blessing. Sometimes they are a, 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 just a, a total waste, uh, if you want to think of it that way. Or sometimes uh, they, they just couldn't be a bigger blessing. And they haven't quite figured out what, what the deal is. How come it keeps coming back to this? Well, this is God with showing you by these cycles that this is exactly how it goes. God always, David, David prayed this in Psalm 51, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. How many times do you think David had to have a, a spirit 
renewed in him. Was it just once? No, it was obviously it was more than once. More than once will we go down into the deep. More than once will we sink down into the mire. More than once will we be disobedient to God. And yet God, our, our Savior, our God, our, our uh, man, I can't even think of the words to call him. God in his love and his majesty and his graciousness and his mercifulness, God will reach down every time we're down in the pit, pull us back out of it, set our feet on a solid rock, clean us off, set us among the saints, we'll worship God, we're up on cloud nine, we're praising God, we're thanking him. But then we get full of pride. Listen to that amen out there. We get full of pride. Right back down where we were. It starts all over again. Then God says, let there be light, and there was light. And the light was the light of Jesus Christ, the light of the gospel. Day two, God said, let there be a firmament. This is God dividing heaven from earth. And this is God telling you, God called the firmament heaven. Uh, he called the waters uh, under the firmament, the seas. And so he shows us there's a difference between where God is and where we are. We are not God. We will never be God. We will never be high enough. We will never be good enough. We will, and you know what? I watched some videos over the weekend that just absolutely blistered me. Videos by guys like Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagin, some of these other clowns that pretend to be preachers, but they're not. Because they're always boasting upon themselves. They're always boasting about their wealth. They're always boasting about how God wants you to be a multi-billionaire like they are. God wants you to have this. God wants you to have that. And um, they denounce anybody who is poor, who can't pay their bills, who doesn't have enough money in the bank account. They will always say that it's your fault. You don't have enough faith. You don't, um, you don't give enough. And that's what it's about. To convince you that the reason why you're not rich is because you have not sent our ministry enough money to make you rich. They will tell you that once you send money to their ministry, that that means that you, that God owes you money. You, God borrowed money from you because apparently, what Gary, God needed it? Couldn't make the house payment on all those mansions, right? That God owes you money. But the Bible says that the, uh, the borrower is uh, the servant to the lender. I'm trying to get this one right. The person who borrows money is the servant and the person who lent the money is the master. And it basically puts you in charge of God and that's a lie. God said as high as the heavens are above the earth, that's how high my thoughts are above your thoughts. And that was one of the things that God was doing with me in my office those three days was convincing me, Mike, what I'm going to do with you and this church will not be your idea. That way, you can't take the credit for it. And I don't take the credit for it. And, I, and God knows me. And my mom knows me. And my wife knows me. And other people know me, and I'm telling you, I will not ever be able to take the credit for what God has done here. Never. So that's part of the process. That's day two. Day three is God planting seed all over the earth. He's planting the word of God. I don't, I don't remember if we got into, I, I know we covered some of the uh, parables that deal with seed and sowing and so on. 
So I'm going to move forward from that. But what God now has done in your life, now that God has got you in a place, and that's, that's what he did. After those three days, two weeks later, there's another day I'm fasting and praying. And I, I'm really sure that what God was doing in my life during that time was he was taking, you know how the Bible says they'll, they'll take their swords and beat them into plowshares? I think that's what God does. God takes his sword, which is his word, and he beats it into a plowshare. And then God plows up the fallow ground in our lives. You know, that, the hardness that we have in our heart. I was pointing to my head when I said heart. All of the old ideas that I had were just that. They were my ideas. They were my hard-heartedness that God said, Mike, I can't plant what I'm going to do in you unless I break up the fallow ground. So God had to do that. Don't be surprised if, let's say this week, not everything goes your way, not everything turns out the way you want it, not everything uh, ends up all jolly and happy and all good. Don't be surprised when those things happen because they are all part of God. Turning over that ground, that hard ground of your life, plowing it up, taking ground, um, you know what fallow means, don't you? In Missouri, what happens to a field that goes fallow? Yeah, it's full of cedars in about 50 years. Full of cedars. And all of those have to be tore up, that ground has to be tilled up again that ground has to be plowed up again and that's what God has to do then God begins to plant the seed of what he wants to do in your life but just like just like planting seed in real life when we plant a seed we don't sit there and stare at it and wait for it to come popping up do we God has planted the seed God has worked that seed into your life He's given you that seed, but what that seed is going to turn into, you may not be able to see it right away. Hang on. Hang on. God's not done. Amen? Day four, which is where we were last week. Tell you what, before I read this, I want to pray. I need you to pray for me this morning. I am struggling to preach. Father, I come before you this morning and I need your grace. Lord, it just seems like my mind is blank. I don't like it when it gets this way. There's not really much I can do to change it. Lord, if these are your people. They're, your, they're yours. They've always been yours. They don't belong to me. These are the sheep of your pasture. You are their shepherd. And Father, I love them. I love each and every one of them. I've prayed for them and for whatever needs they might have in their life. I'm praying now, Father, that in due season you grant them those needs. Father, maybe I'm trying too hard. Maybe I'm trying to be too dramatic or whatever. But Father, just settle my mind, settle my heart. Help me, dear God, to just speak and preach the word that you've given me to preach this morning. Lord, I want it to be a blessing.
to everyone who hears from, from me all the way down into these pews, into those internet lines. Lord, may they go out all over this country, all into Canada, England, Scotland, Ireland, Australia, Kenya, the places, Father, that I, I have no idea, Lord, where we're reaching. But, Lord, my heart is that you speak to your people and that you help them this morning. And so, Father, I ask God for your help. Humble me and sanctify me. Make me fit for your use and for your kingdom's sake. I love you, Jesus. I love how you're the preacher that stands behind the pulpit and preaches the word, Father, that these people and, and myself need to hear. So, Lord, would you, would you speak the word? Help us to be like that centurion who told Jesus, just speak the word and it'll be done. And Lord, would you just but speak the word this morning and do the work that you want to do in the hearts of your people this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, day four is where some of our confusion came in last Sunday. If you remember, I lost my notes. I have them back. I was going over them last night. And I saw some things that I think God wanted me to change about it. But let's read this. This is happening on day four. Now remember, days one, two, and three, we've got light. And we've got the division of light and darkness. But we have no source of that light. That source of that light is Jesus Christ. It is the light of the gospel. We, we now see that. And we're going to see it now as God speaks it into creation. And God said, and this is Genesis chapter 1, verse 14... God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs. Notice this. Let's count these. Let them be for signs, for seasons, and for days, and for years. Notice this, that God mentions in here that he has seasons. Seasons. And we know by way of reading Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, that after this week is over with, there's going to be another week that follows it. Meaning that God is going to have another week to do again the work that he's been doing in the first place in your life. And maybe you might have the question, will there ever be a day when God is done working on me and I would say, as long as you're breathing air down here, the answer is no. There will, God will always work in your life. He is always working to perfect you. He is always working to train you. He is always working to uh, chasten you if necessary but then to show you and manifest to you his love if necessary. God is always working in your life. And there isn't a day that goes by where God is not working in your life. So he used them, the, the stars and the sun and the moon. He said, let them be for signs, for seasons. For days and for years, we measure everything with the, I call them the heavenly luminaries. The sun, the moon, and the stars. We measure seasons out with the stars, with the moon. We measure seasons and days out. The days are measured with the sun. Years are measured also with the sun and so on and so on. Every part of time and how we reckon time here in this world is always done by the sun, the moon, and the stars. 
And so notice this in verse 16. God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Now this is where I'm going this morning, I think. Is which would you rather have? The lesser light or the greater light? Think about it. God set them in the firmament and he made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night. This shows you that they are in authority in your life. Now I want you to think for a minute, and you've heard me say this a jillion times. Stars are angels. You would be hard pressed to show me from the Bible a place where stars are not angels. Now... I can say I like astro astronomy. I almost said astrology. That was a bad mistake. I like astronomy. I like looking at the stars. I like looking at the formations of the stars, pictures of the stars, galaxies, and star clusters, and all of those things. I like looking at all of that stuff. Okay? But I don't know a whole lot about them. So what I don't know scientifically... All I can do is share with you what I do know theologically. And theologically, as far as the Bible is concerned, I can tell you with a certainty that the stars that you see in the sky above you each and every night, that is precisely what they are. They are angels. And they're to, with me, there's no getting around that. You say, well, you know, I don't know if that works out scientifically. Don't care. I don't care. The, uh, there is there's no... Uh, I cannot show you from the scripture anything that contradicts the idea that stars are angels. Now, think about this. When the wise men were traveling from the east to go find Jesus where he was born, they were being led by a what? What do you think that star was? Was it a UFO? Could have been. They didn't identify it. Um, what, was, it a, was it a meteorite? No, meteors travel way too fast, and there's usually nothing that slows them down in the sky. So we know it couldn't be that either. It had to have been an angel that led them to the exact place where Jesus was. And that's what the Bible says. Job talks about how the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. He said the stars are the sons of God. The sons of God are the angels. Psalm 82 says, I've said you are gods and all of you children are the most high. He's talking about the stars. One third of the stars of heaven are kicked out of heaven. And the Bible tells us in the same chapter that it's one third of the angels. So now keep this in mind. Verse 17. God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. God saw that it was good and the evening and the morning were the first, fourth day. Now, here's what I want you to think about. Either A, you have not been saved, you're not born again, but God now has, has shown you the true source of the light. And that source is the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the word was God. By the way, that 1529, uh, 10, or yeah, 15, whatever it was, 1536, 1529 Bible, I don't remember what it is. Got it at home, I'm reading it. 
that Bible that dates all the way back to William Tyndale and goes all the way back to the 1530s says it almost exactly the way that it says here. In fact, the, one of the facts that I read was is that the King James Bible that we have now is, is made up of about 80% of, of Tyndale's Bible. Okay? Listen, God's people have been believing the same thing for years. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. God shined the light uh, in your heart. He shined the gospel, the light of the gospel in your heart. And you now at this point, you're either going to believe it or you're going to believe something else. And you're either going to believe the greater light or you're going to believe and follow the lesser light. And I'm going to show you that. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. To rule over the day and over the night. And to divide the light from darkness. And God saw that it was good in the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Take your Bible, turn to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. I want you to see this. I want you to see that God drew for us a picture of the solar system. In our Bibles, long before there was ever a telescope to see it with. Does anybody know when Neptune was discovered? The planet Neptune? Maybe look it up on your phone. I don't know the answer. Somebody look up when Neptune was first discovered. I, and I'm, and I guarantee you it wasn't in uh, 24 A.D. What? 1846. And did they discover it with their eyes? No, you can't see it with your eyes. They used a telescope. It can only be seen with a telescope. Okay? Now, um, so th our knowledge that our solar system from the point, from the vantage point of Earth, I'm going to take Earth out of the number. From the vantage point of Earth, our solar system has one sun and seven planets. Okay? Pluto, sorry Pluto, you're not a planet. Now watch this. Revelation 1, verse 12, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs, I like this, were white like wool, as white as snow. Give me a verse that has something in it where it's white as wool, white as snow. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Do you not understand that when they laid that crown of thorns and tamped it down on Jesus' head, those thorns were a representation of our sins. He bore those sins as a crown over him, bore those sins to the cross, and when he died, our sins died with him. Amen. Yeah. And so now, that's why the hairs of his head are like wool, white as snow. Because that's what God did with our sins. His feet was like unto fine brass, as if they'd burned in a furnace. And his voice as the sound of many waters, and, he had, and his right hand seven stars. Now look at this now. How many stars? Seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And notice this now. Verse 16. His countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. So who, who's the sun here? 
Jesus is the sun. Remember that? He's the greater light that rules over the day. Now, take a look at this. I drew this myself. <clears throat> yeah, you don't have to believe that one either. From the vantage point of earth, here's Christ. Mercury, one. Venus, two. Mars, three. Jupiter, four. Saturn, five. Uranus, six. Neptune, seven. How many stars? Seven. From the vantage point of earth, and where is the sun in relation to those seven stars? In the midst of them. Because that's what Revelation 1 says. That he saw the, the Christ. Uh, where is that? Help me find it. Re Revelation chapter 1. In verse 13, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his foot. And his, I read that to you all ago. Here is Christ, the Son, and he's standing in the midst of the seven stars. The seven candlesticks, which are the seven stars, which are the seven planets from the vantage point of earth. That's how the solar system looks. And John wrote that down before. I would say the last two or three planets were ever even discovered. John wrote that down by inspiration of God. So the greater light that rules over the day is Christ. What would be the lesser light that rules over the night? Let me show it to you like this. There are two lights here in your Bible. One is greater than the other. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai bearing the law in his hand, his face shone so bright that they had to put a veil over it. Christ shines brighter than Moses does, does he not? So let me ask you a question. Do you know somebody who believes that in order to truly be saved, you must go back and follow the laws of Moses? I know somebody like that. It's called Hebrew Roots. And they, they believe that Christ came to take us back to Moses and following Moses' law. But that's not how it is. This, in fact, I'll show you how smart God is. What is the lesser light that rules over the night? The moon. Does the moon have its own light? Where does the moon get her light? The sun reflects off the moon. And do you know what we found? You know what they found out? When Neil Armstrong picked up that, he did what's called a, uh, um, a I can't remember the word for it, uh, but he picked up a scoop of moon dust and shoved it down in his pocket just in case uh, they couldn't spend any more time on the moon. He want, they said, we got to have something to, to bring back with. So he brings back a pocket full of moon dust. You know what they found out? No wonder the moon shines so bright. That dust is glass. It's powdered glass. It's a mirror. And no wonder it's so reflective. It is shining forth with the light given to it by the sun. <laughs> Moses can only shine with the light that Christ sends to him and gives to him. You can only shine in this world like I preached last Sunday. You can only shine in this world by the light that Jesus sends to you. Now you can have one of two religions. Do or done. Which one? 
Which one do you want? You want the one where you've got to keep following the law? I would, I would guarantee you that everybody sitting in this room this week has already broken this law at least one time this week. Am I wrong? Not wrong. This flesh abhors God's law and will not live by it or under it. That's why it must be destroyed. So the choice that you have to make, turn to 1 Thessalonians 5, the choice you have to make is whether or not you're going to try to follow the do religion or the done religion. Roman Catholicism, and I hope they're listening in Samburu and Turkana, Kenya. Roman Catholicism follows a lesser light. And those people are in darkness. The Mercy Hospital Organization may have done Jefferson County much good by injecting millions and millions of dollars into our local hospital. But one of the things that absolutely just, it angers me every time I go over there, is the idolatry that exists on every wall in that building. There is the idol of a dead man on a cross, and I'm here to tell you that is not Jesus Christ. I, do, I will not bow down to it. I will not pray to it. I will not cross myself. I will not do it. My Savior and the sacrifice that He made was a one-time sacrifice only. In fact, the phrase that we have in English, once and for all, guess where that came from? King James Bible. And we still use it. Once and for all. I'm going to defeat it once and for all. That came right out of the Bible referring to the sacrifice that Christ made. When He made the sacrifice, He made it once and He made it for everybody. But your Roman Catholic chooses to follow the due religion. They must not eat meat on Fridays. They must go to Mass. They must confess all of their sins to the priest in the confessional. Uh, if you want to see something that uh, I, did this, I did this last year, and I'm going to encourage you. I don't try to sell my own videos to everybody in the church, but I did a series... Uh, this last year of Watchmen broadcast on the Catholic Church. And I'm going to strongly encourage you to watch that. It will shake you up. It is the most filthy, disgusting, idol-worshipping, Babylonian whorehouse that the devil ever invented and they are seen as the fine upstanding godly men those priests everybody sees them like they are looking at God themselves they look at the nuns as if they were looking at the holy bride of Jesus themselves truth however is always opposite of I don't even know how to finish that one the truth of them is the opposite of what they want you to think about them. Something like that. Now in 1 Thessalonians 5, 
The Bible says, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Notice this, you are all children of light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be what? Sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken, are drunken in the night. What, what's the average hours of a good tavern in this town? Two o'clock in the afternoon? In the morning? Boy, that's getting the motor started early, isn't it? Why are taverns always dimly lit? I don't know. They that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. God wants you walking and following the greater light rather than the lesser light. See, it's the moon, but it's also the stars as well. Now, what did we say stars were? Let's say this again. They're angels, okay? So let's turn to Amos. You know how the, the motto today is, follow the stars, right? Follow the stars. Thank your lucky stars. God, however, said in Amos 5, you have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch and Cheon, your images. And then he said, the star of your God, which you made to yourselves. Instead of following Christ, the light of the glorious gospel, you're following a far lesser light. You're following angels, which in this case are not part of the good angels that fight for us day and night, you're following the evil angels who are in rebellion to God. They're going to try with Satan to take over the throne of God. There will be a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. The dragon fought and his angels, but they're going to be cast out of heaven and cast to the earth. And there are people right now who are following after those kinds of spirits. They're not following the Holy Spirit. Paul wrote to us in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 11. And he told us, and he said, you watch out for somebody that comes preaching another Jesus, another gospel, and following after another spirit. And why did Paul warn them of that? Because he knew that that spirit was a spirit that led them into darkness. And see, darkness is where you came from. Darkness is where God found you and pulled you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And yet, the devil comes around makes a new deal with you, says to follow him, and so you do. And you don't realize that you're following the star of your God, which you, notice that it says, ye made to yourselves. 
When I was doing the research on the Catholic Church, I was researching all the different statues of Mary. And one thing I've discovered in researching all of those statues was, boy, she's got a lot of faces. Every, every statue of Mary seems to look different than every other statue of Mary that I saw. And I guess that's because whoever carved out this particular statue sees Mary one way, while the guy that carved her out on another statue sees her a different way, and they don't look the same, but the church tells you that's Mary. And it tells you, you want your prayers heard? You must pray to her in order to have your prayers heard. And what it boils down to is, every sculptor carves Mary out of his, the imagery that's in his own heart. And isn't that what a lot of church people do? They carve an image of God out that comes out not from the Word of God, but it comes from the imagery that's in their own heart. In other words, uh, a, a man will be living in an in a adulterous lifestyle. He'll have, he'll have a woman moved in with him without the bonds or the blessing of marriage. And he'll say, I believe this is the woman God wants me with. And uh, so I believe that we're soulmates. And I believe that God wants us to be together. So the God that he's referring to is not the God of this. It's the God that he carved out of his wicked heart. That God says to him, you can live with this woman without the bonds and the, and the joy uh, and the goodness of marriage. You can live together in sin, but it'll be okay. I'll give you a pass on it. And that's the God that they've carved out. Other people carve out a God that allows them as little church time as can be possibly had. And they'll say, well, that's, that's the God I, I serve. Because God's not really in the churches. The churches are all corrupt. And I just don't go to any man's church. And so we, we go about that much. And that's how much our God tells us to go. That's not what the Bible says, though. Not forsaking the assembling yourselves together as a manner of some is. Or the God, they'll carve a God out that will allow them to live as sodomites. Or they'll carve a God out that will allow them to practice witchcraft. Or they'll carve a God out that will allow them to steal, to, to murder unborn children. You see, they've carved out their own God out of the wickedness of their own heart. Mind you this, abortion will be an issue on this year's ballot, will it not? The definition of marriage will be on the ballot this year, will it not be? And it amazes me the number of church people who always seem to get it wrong in the ballot box. That's because they've carved out a God that is not the God of this Bible. It's not. In, Acts, in Amos chapter 5, verse 8, Seek him that maketh the seven stars in Orion, and turneth the shadow of death into morning, and maketh the day dark with night, that calleth for the waters of the sea, and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. That's, that's who you seek out. That's the light that you choose to follow, is the one. Not, not, the, not the God who is a star, 
but the God who made those stars. That's who you follow. Obadiah. In fact, turn your Bible to this one. I'm about to freak you out. Some of you. Some of you were that way long before you ever met me. <clears throat> Concerning the stars and the heavens. Obadiah, yeah, keep looking. It's that, it's that book you don't go to very often. So it got, it's only got one chapter in it, so I'll give you an extra 15 seconds to find it. It's probably stuck to the chapter next to it. Obadiah chapter 1, God's talking about how they exalt themselves. And God said this, Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle. Did you know that God here just prophesied of this? The day two men landed on the lunar surface. Their, what was it that Neil Armstrong said when they landed? The eagle has landed. And they got to design their own patch. And it was of an eagle with a branch in its talons. What is it doing? It built a nest, a habitation. The astronauts spent actually two sleep cycles on the lunar surface. They didn't just land, dig up some dust, and take off. They, they made themselves little beds there in that eagle module, and they slept twice there on the surface of the moon. God predicted that long before Christ ever walked on water. Now, let me show you this, and I'm going to let you go. Jude chapter 1, turn there. And I'm going to apologize for this not being one of my best messages. Of course, I should apologize for that every Sunday, I think. Jude. Jude and Peter both, it almost looked like they were looking at the same document when they wrote about false prophets and false teachers because they said almost the exact same thing. Actually, the Holy Ghost gave what he gave to both men simultaneously uh, and that was a sure sign that they were witnesses to each other. Jude tells us to watch out for these false teachers and false prophets. He said, these are spots in your feast of charity. He said, when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water. What is a cloud without water good for? What's the only thing that it, that it does? Blocks the sun. And that's all it does is keep the sunlight from shining down in your heart. So clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead. You know what twice dead means? They are not going to heaven. God has already judged them as being guilty and they are going to be cast in the lake of fire. And there isn't a thing anybody can do about it. Now, I've had people over the years write me emails chewing me out for things that I've said against Kenneth Copeland or Joyce Myers. They said, these are Christians and you're supposed to go to them. And, and, and I'm going, number one, uh-uh. They're not Christians. Number two, do you think that I would ever get a chance? Joyce Myers lives in this county. Do you think I'd get a chance to go see her? Uh-uh. 
But folks, you know what these are? Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, and wandering stars. You know what the Greek word for that phrase, wandering stars, is? You're going to like this one. Planetase. It's where we get the word planet. Do you know why? Because the ast ancient astronomers noticed that there were stars that weren't following the monthly path across the sky. There would be a star over here like Jupiter, and in a couple months it was way over here where it shouldn't be. And so the word they used for those wandering stars was planetase. And that's why we call them planets to this day. Wandering stars means they're not fixed. Means if you're going to try to navigate by using the stars, you can't count on them. Because they're always moving in an unpredictable path. What did, what did Solomon say about the, the, the strange woman? Her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. And so you have a choice to make of whether you're going to follow the true light, which is, and I'll even say like this, because this is... You, you're going to be able to tell that I'm, going, that I'm studying Bible history for the next six months. Because it's just going to squeeze out of me all the time. You can either follow a Bible that so far the evidence that I've seen going all the way back to the 1300s has not changed significantly since then, much less the King James, which hasn't changed at all in over 400 years. You can either follow that or the wandering star Bibles. That, that sheet that I gave out last week, George, you'll see that the translation is all over the place. And you can't you can't make any sense out of it. And you're always chasing after it. What's it going to be like next year? Because it's going to change. Let's stand to our feet.